15 seconds. So at this point, let's replay the detonation. Go back and watch Mike in action once again. Remember those final last seconds? Five, four, three, two, one, teaser. This is the largest fireball ever produced. At its maximum, it measures about three and one quarter miles in diameter. Compared to the skyline of New York, this means that with the Empire State Building as zero point, the Mike Fireball would extend downtown to Washington Square and uptown to Central Park. In other words, the Fireball alone would engulf about one quarter of the island of Manhattan. The tremendous upsurge of air from the detonation rapidly pushes up the Mike Cloud. Again, nothing of this height and width has ever before been witnessed. If the picture is stopped at this point in the cloud's growth, the height of the cloud is approximately 40,000 feet. This means that 32 Empire State buildings at 1,250 feet per building could be piled one on top of the other before they would attain the cloud's height at this time, roughly two minutes after zero. Some 10 minutes later, the cloud approaches its maximum. At this time, the mushroom portion of the cloud has pushed up to around 10 miles and spreads out along the base of the stratosphere to a width of about 100 miles, while the stem itself is pushed upward deep into the stratosphere to a height of about 25 miles. Into the areas of target evaluation or secondary effects, it can be safely assumed that there was complete annihilation within a radius of three miles or out to and including all of Enjabi that there was severe to moderate damage out to seven miles or down to Rujoro, and that light damage extended as far as 10 miles or down to Runnet. What you have just seen was an awesome turning point in history, a development affecting not only the future of humanity, but the security of our nation. President Eisenhower was speaking, not alone, to the United Nations, but to every American when he said, let no one think that the expenditure of vast sums for weapons and systems of defense can guarantee the absolute safety for the cities and citizens of any nation. The awful arithmetic of the atomic bomb does not permit of any such easy solution. Two courses of action must be followed on the long and difficult road to peace. First, unceasing efforts to reach international agreement upon such a sound proposal as President Eisenhower made to the United Nations for the constructive use of atomic energy in the service of all mankind. One which I, who have spent so much of my life in the military profession would have preferred never to use. That new language is the language 
of atomic warfare. The atomic age has moved forward at such a pace that every citizen of the world should have some comprehension, at least in comparative terms, of the extent of this development, of the utmost significance to every one of us. Clearly, if the peoples of the world are to conduct an intelligent search for peace, they must be armed with the significant facts of today's existence.